Hey everyone, Victor is here and in this video I want to talk about the common HNMR patterns that you definitely want to know for your exams and homework. These patterns are a definite must-know for anyone who wants to be ahead of the curve and learn how to solve the spectroscopy questions quickly. So without any further ado, let's jump into our first group, which is the ethyl group. In case of the ethyl group, you're going to see two signals. We are going to have a quartet, which is responsible for two hydrogens, and we're going to see a triplet, which is responsible for three hydrogens. If we look at our ethyl group, and let's say I assign my groups as A and B for my uh, hydrogens, the hydrogens A are my two hydrogens, which is a quartet, and the hydrogens B are my three hydrogens, which is a triplet. You have probably seen this one already a million times, so let's move to the next one. And the next group is just as iconic, that is the propyl group. So the hallmark of the propyl group is going to be a triplet, which is responsible for two hydrogens, then another triplet over here that is responsible for three hydrogens, and then in the middle we have this large signal, uh, this signal with a big multiplicity, which has one, two, three, four, five, six peaks, so that is a sextet, which is going to be responsible for two hydrogens in your group. And like before, if I assign my protons as A, B, and C, my group A is the first triplet, my group B is my sextet, and finally my group C is my last triplet on the right. The next one is equally as common, and that is the isopropyl group. The hallmark of the isopropyl group is a doublet signal, which is going to be responsible for six hydrogens, and a big, ugly multiplet on the left side, uh, which is going to be responsible for only one hydrogen. Technically, that multiplet over here is a septet, it has seven peaks. However, depending on the quality of your spectrum and the strength of the instrument, it may or may not show as a septet. So it is better to say that that is just going to be a multiplet, but if you do have a good quality spectrum, typically you will be able to see a septet there. Now, the next typical pattern is a little bit of a mess. It looks like two doublets. We have one doublet on the left side, which is going to be responsible for two hydrogens. We have another doublet on the right side, which is going to be responsible for six hydrogens. And then we have some sort of monstrosity in the middle, which is going to be one hydrogen. That monstrosity, that multiplet, is technically should be a non-ad, because that hydrogen is sitting between eight other hydrogens, so eight neighbors, n plus one rule, should be a non-ad ideally. However, depending on the nature of this X group that I have sitting on my isobutyl group here, uh, we can potentially have those uh, split into something a little bit more difficult, so this one is a safe bet, some sort of a crazy multiplet. So if I were to assign my protons, the ones on the left, that are my protons B, the one in the middle, that is my proton C, and the one on the right, that doublet, that is going to be my protons A. All right, moving on to the next pattern, this one, I here have the pentyl group, however, the characteristic that I want to show here is what I like to call a forest, which is going to be an overlap of multiple signals in the aliphatic region. This one, the one that I circled, technically, that is four hydrogens, but that is not a four hydrogen signal, that is actually an overlap of two two hydrogen signals, and those ones correspond to CH2, CH2 in the middle of a longer chain. So whenever you have a long chain, you are going to get some sort of a crazy multiplet, some sort of a crazy forest in this uh, aliphatic region between 1 and 1.5 usually. And whenever you see something like that, most likely that is going to be a long chain. Other than that, that's not much of a pattern on its own. And before we move on to the next block, here is a low-hanging fruit, a third beauty butyl group. Whenever you see a one giant singlet which is responsible for nine hydrogens, that is your third butyl group. 
that one is easy, let's move on. Now, my next block is going to be various types of aromatic signals. And of course, I want to start with just a simple aromatic ring by itself. Due to the internal plane of symmetry that we have within the aromatic ring, we should expect to see three signals from this molecule, or from this part of the molecule, I should say. My protons A should be giving me doublets, my protons B should be giving me triplets, and my proton C should also give me a triplet for the signal. And if I look at the example that I have over here, I have a triplet, I have a triplet, and I have a doublet. Nice, clean, aromatic ring, no problems with that. However, this nice and clean aromatic region like that is, well, it's not always going to look like that. Here is the example of ethyl benzene, and if we look at the aromatic ring, instead of nice three signals, we get this bullshit. The thing is, signals of the aromatic ring sometimes are so similar to each other that instead of giving you a nice clean three signal pattern, they are going to overlap and they're going to give you either a crazy multiplet like I have in this case, or they can even um, overlap into a big giant singlet of five hydrogens. So whenever you see one big giant or a big massive signal at the aromatic region which integrates at five hydrogens, well, that's just your fennel ring, just the aromatic ring, and that's about it. However, things get a little bit more interesting when we go to disubstituted aromatic compounds. Those are very common guests on the exam, so you definitely need to know how to spot different patterns for the uh, disubstituted aromatic compounds. So here, I'm starting with the ortho-substituted uh, aromatic compound, where my groups X and Y are some different groups. If those groups are the same, we are going to have symmetry in the molecule, and the spectrum is going to be much easier, so for the rest of this video here, my groups X and Y and Z, when I have the group Z, they're all going to be different groups. So in this case, all four protons on our aromatic ring, they should all give you uh, separate different signals. We should expect doublet here, triplet, triplet, and another doublet. And if I look at my spectrum, I have doublet, triplet, triplet, and another doublet. So, everything fits. Whenever you see two doublets to triplets, that is the ortho-substituted aromatic ring. When it comes to the meta-substituted aromatic ring, well, in that case, we are looking at singlet, doublet, doublet, and triplet. So, here I have my singlet, my doublet, my doublet, and my triplet. Pretty straightforward as well. The most common pattern that I see on the exams all the time, though, is the para-substituted, para-disubstituted aromatic ring. Due to the two planes of symmetry that we have in this molecule, we have a horizontal and we have a vertical plane of symmetry, we have only two unique environments here, so we are going to have our protons A and proton B, and those are just going to give you a doublet and another doublet. So, whenever in the aromatic region you are seeing a nice two pair of doublets, a very symmetrical, very nice uh, um, pattern here, where you have two hydrogens integrated for each of those signals, that is your para-substituted aromatic ring. Now, although tri-substituted aromatic compounds are not as common on the exams and homeworks, I have seen those, and it still might be a very good idea to be able to spot those when you have them. So, in the first case, I have the tri-substituted compound where my substituents are in the first, second, and the third position to each other. In this case, the leftover three protons that we have on the ring are going to give you a doublet, triplet, and another doublet for the signal, and that's precisely what we have in this example. I have a doublet, doublet, and a triplet in my spectrum. The next one is going to be the tri-substituted uh, molecule where the substituents are in the positions 1, 2, and 4. In this case, we would expect to see a singlet, doublet, and another doublet. So, what we have here, I have a doublet, doublet, and there is my singlet. And finally, the easiest pattern out of all of those is going to be where my substituents are in the positions 
1, 3 and 5. In this case, I expect to see three nice singlets and that is precisely what I see in this spectrum over here on the screen. Now, I do have to make a small disclaimer though that, of course, for the purposes of this video, I cherry-picked my spectra and I made sure that my spectra have very clean and very well-defined uh, patterns. In real life, things are not going to be always as nice and clean, however, what I have noticed that within the scope of a regular course, usually whenever we give spectra to the students, instructors tend to give you cleaner versions of those spectra, so typically you should be able to spot those uh, patterns and uh, figure out what's going on there and spectra are usually not too messy. Now, the last one that I have to point out here before I wrap it up is the vinyl group. While I don't see vinyl groups all that often on the introductory organic chemistry tests, they do show up from time to time and that is a good pattern to be able to spot as well. So whenever in the region where we normally see double bonds, which is between 5 and 7, we see a signal with 4 peaks, then doublet and doublet, that is your uh, vinyl group. The signal with four peaks, it might look like it's a quartet, but that is actually a complex signal that is a doublet of doublets, that's not a quartet. And then the two doublets that we also have there, the characteristic of those is going to be a different spin-spin splitting constant. What I mean here is that the distance between the peaks in one doublet is going to be smaller than the distance between the peaks in the other doublet. So whenever you see a picture like that, that is your vinyl group. So make sure you learn how to spot all of those signals in your NMR practice problems, because I can guarantee if you learn to spot those, you will be able to solve your spectra way faster which will save you invaluable time on the test. And in my next video, I will show you how I use some of these patterns to figure out the molecular structure for the molecules where we do not have integrations given to us in the HNMR spectra. So make sure you hit the like button, subscribe so you don't miss it, and I will see you next time!